In this video, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on the background of Isaiah chapter 53 and how in antiquity, the sages and the rabbis all taught that the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 was a prophecy about the coming Mashiach or Messiah. Or the fact that they taught that right up until Yeshua or Jesus came and once the Christian gospel started to spread, Chapter 53 in Isaiah started causing all kinds of trouble in the synagogues. This was because of its overt resemblance to the work and the person of Yeshua as the Messiah. So as a result, Isaiah chapter 53 started getting skipped in the synagogues. They would go from chapter 52 one week to chapter 54 the next week. As a result, today many Jews, when, when they hear Isaiah 53 read out loud, mistakenly think that they're hearing the New Testament because it so closely resembles Yeshua. You should see this incredible video, I'm going to link to it below, of Jews hearing Isaiah 53 read for them for the first time on the streets of Israel. It's amazing. Check it out. So today, Judaism argues that the suffering servant talked about in Isaiah 53 is referring to the nation of Israel instead of the, a prophecy of the future Mashiach. And in a recent chat with a Jewish friend of mine who converted, or I suppose it'd be more accurate to say reverted from Christianity to Judaism, she sent me a list of 12 reasons that the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 could not be referring to Jesus. She didn't mention the original source where this list came from, but I did a little digging and it seems to have come from a book called Christianity Uncovered, Viewed Through Open Eyes, by a man named Hugh Fogelman. So apparently this list is floating around the internet. So I wanted to take just a few minutes and set the record straight from a Christian perspective. So here are the 12 reasons that Isaiah 53 could not be about Yeshua. Okay, let's get into this. You'll first hear the reason just as it was given to me, and then I'll offer a brief response on each one. So here we go. Here's the first reason. When was Jesus sick? Isaiah 53.3 reads Ish Makavot, which refers to a man who is habitually or chronically ill. Nothing in the New Testament says Jesus was ever ill, even once. Actually, the Hebrew phrase Ish Makavot can refer to habitual pain and suffering as well as sickness. It depends on context, and even the Orthodox Jewish Bible translates this verse as acquainted with suffering, not habitually sick. And there's a ton of scriptural support for Yeshua as a man acquainted with suffering. Look at Matthew 27, where we see him stripped of his clothes and, and crowned with sharp thorns and mocked and insulted and spit on and beaten and scourged and crucified. That's a lot of suffering. When did Jesus suffer from leprosy? Verse 4 reads, Nagua, which is a word in the Hebrew Bible that refers to one who was stricken with leprosy, as we see in 2 Kings 15.5 and Leviticus 13.3, 9, and 20. Jesus never was. Actually, Nagua means to touch or to reach or strike, and the Hebrew word for leprosy is tsara'at. And to be struck with leprosy or be leprous would be metzara. So verse 4 doesn't say the servant would suffer from leprosy. It says, Yet we esteemed him stricken, nagua, smitten by God and afflicted. But let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that the person that wrote this claim was right, and it really does refer to the suffering servant being stricken with leprosy. Wouldn't that make it even more nonsensical that the suffering servant could be the nation of Israel? I mean, are we supposed to imagine that, that the nation of Israel was or, or someday will be completely stricken by leprosy? When was Jesus without form or comeliness, undesired so that everyone despised and rejected him? On the contrary, the Gospels insist Jesus was greatly admired everywhere he went, by every segment of society, and even to regions he never visited. Actually, I would say that if Jesus was greatly admired everywhere he went by every segment of society, he wouldn't have been crucified. Verse 3 reads, He was despised and rejected by men. And there are many examples of this prophecy being fulfilled by Yeshua. As I just mentioned, he was beaten and flogged and, and crucified. But there are other ways that he was despised and rejected by men as well. Here are just a few examples. In Luke 4, we read this, When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him, Yeshua, out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. And Luke 23 says, But they all cried together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. So here everyone's calling for Jesus' crucifixion, not Barabbas. And in John 1 we read, He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Why wasn't Jesus humble as the servant in verse 7 was? The Gospels record several haughty words coming from his lips. 
All these verses, and many more, especially in John's Gospel, show that far from being humble, Jesus thought very highly of himself. Sure, it's true that some of the things that Yeshua said could definitely be seen as haughty or prideful. That is, if he was a mere man. But he was God incarnate, fully man and fully God. He didn't overstate who he was. He spoke of himself accurately. In Matthew 20, Yeshua epitomized true humility in that he came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think about the love and the humility that it would take for God to leave heaven and come to earth as a mere man. In scripture, we read that Yeshua, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why didn't Jesus remain silent as the servant in verse 7 did? All of the Gospels, without exception, say Jesus had quite a lot to say during his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. John 18 relates quite a long defense of himself, intimating he was being railroaded and that he was being kidnapped in the dark rather than in the day when his followers might have defended him. Well, the prophecy actually doesn't say that Yeshua never spoke at all. What it says is, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Is there evidence that Yeshua fulfilled this prophecy? Yeah, there's a lot. Check it out. Look at the scene in Matthew 27 as Yeshua stood before Pilate. But when he, Yeshua, was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. And in Luke 23 we read, So he questioned him at some length, but he, Yeshua, made no answer. And Mark 14 says, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Why did Jesus do violence and speak violence, whereas the servant in verse 9 had done no violence? In Luke 19, 27, Jesus takes the time to fashion a whip with which he beat the money changers and sacrificial animal vendors. Did you know that striking an animal fit for sacrifice would cause a great loss in value of the animal? So every animal Jesus struck was a separate instance of theft? There goes the claim that Jesus never committed any sins. Wow. Okay. So there's a few things we need to address here. First of all, Luke 19, 27 is part of the parable of the ten minas. So I'm sure that's not what whoever wrote this claim intended. More than likely they meant uh, Luke 19.45, which says, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold. Secondly, none of the passages in the New Testament that talk about Jesus cleansing or clearing out the temple courts mention him striking or beating the money changers or the animals. They all say he drove them from the temple courts. Now, the Greek word used here is ekbalin, which means to expel or to drive or to cast or send out. And therefore, number three, Yeshua did no violence, just like it was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 9. He never beat or attacked or physically harmed anybody during his earthly ministry. And if we take a broader look at this verse, I think we find even more compelling evidence that Isaiah 53 is about Yeshua. We see this phrase here, he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. That's figurative language. In ancient Hebrew, that was a phrase that was commonly used to describe an innocent person. So Isaiah prophesied that the suffering servant's execution would be wholly undeserved because he was innocent. And that was exactly the case with Yeshua. In fact, the Apostle Peter quotes from this very verse from Isaiah 53, 9 to show us that Jesus was fulfilled filling this prophecy. In 1 Peter 2.22, Peter writes about Yeshua saying that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. This aspect of innocence in Isaiah's prophecy seems to point us away from the nation of Israel being the suffering servant, because Israel is not an innocent, unblemished lamb that was killed for the unrighteous. Yeshua was. Why did Jesus deceive people while the servant does not? Jesus was not only a false prophet, but also deceived his disciples by saying he would return in their lifetime. But they all died before Jesus got around to fulfilling his prophecy. One would think that if he really was the Son of God, he would have convinced his dad to let his prophecy come true. 
It sounds like this claim is referring to Matthew 16, 28, where Yeshua says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So whoever wrote this claim seems to be suggesting that in this passage, Yeshua was referring to his final return. But the scriptural data suggests something else. This promise from Yeshua is mentioned in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in each case, it's followed immediately by the transfiguration. This is where Yeshua led some of his disciples up on a high mountain and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And we know from some of Yeshua's other teachings in the New Testament that the kingdom of God wasn't some future state. It was something that began with his advent on the earth in the first century. In Mark 1, Yeshua proclaims, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the gospel. And in Matthew 12, after casting out demons from the blind and mute man, Yeshua says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yeshua taught what theologians have come to call an already but not yet kingdom. It began with his arrival on earth in the first century, but it won't be fully consummated until his second coming. So it seems most natural to interpret Jesus' prophecy here in Matthew 16 that There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom as a reference to the transfiguration, which Peter and James and John would witness just six days later. Why was Jesus not buried with the wicked as according to verse 9? The Gospels tell us Jesus died with some wicked people. Why were there no rich people who died with Jesus? The Gospels tell us he was buried in the tomb of a rich man, a tomb that had never been used before. Okay, these two claims can be answered together because they both refer to the first part of Isaiah 53, 9, which says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Now, keep in mind that the genre of prophecy relies heavily on symbolism and figurative language. And so this prophecy can be seen as being fulfilled by the fact that Yeshua was going to be executed and buried with criminals until a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, stepped in and offered his tomb. And by the way, this passage seems to make it even more problematic that the suffering servant here in Isaiah 53 would be the nation of Israel. I mean, how and why would Israel be assigned a grave with the wicked or be put to death for the sins of others or or buried with the rich? Why didn't Jesus have children? When were his days lengthened? On the contrary, Jesus died in the midst of his days. The Bible says that a righteous man can live to 70, but Jesus died only half that age, around 33 years. We're told Jesus was the Son of God, but how can God's days be lengthened? Okay, so these final three claims can all be answered together as well. They all refer to a phrase here in Isaiah 53.10, which says, He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. So first, this claim wants to interpret verse 10 literally as literal offspring. However, given the genre of prophecy with its use of symbolism and figurative language, a literal interpretation isn't required, especially when we look at the totality of the messianic prophecies in the Tanakh. Christian theologians see the fulfillment of this prophecy in the idea that the Zerah, the seed or the offspring that's mentioned in this verse, refers to the suffering servant's spiritual progeny, the generation of people that would become children of God through their faith in Yeshua. John 1 tells us that all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Secondly, the phrase prolong his days finds fulfillment in Yeshua's resurrection. It speaks to his time on earth, which ended with his resurrection and his ascension to God's right hand. God's days weren't literally lengthened, of course, because he's eternal. But this again, this is the figurative language of prophecy. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on biblical prophecy, but I think we can see how sound hermeneutical principles can at least give us a way into understanding what Isaiah 53 is all about. But please, don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. Study the scriptures. Ask God to guide you and see what he reveals to you. Shalom.